We're going to have our reading now. Um, we've reached Revelation chapter 5. So if you grab the church Bible, it's on page 1,236. It's on the screen as well. Revelation chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the centre of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen, and the elders fell down and worshipped. Uh, in 1981, the American comedian Mel Brooks wrote, produced, directed and starred in what many regard as one of the worst movies ever made. The History of the World, Part 1, received awful reviews from critics. It ended up winning the award for the most painfully unfunny comedy at the 1981 Bad Movie Awards Ceremony. One critic said it was not only not funny, but a big overblown crashing bore. Another critic described it as a rambling, undisciplined, sometimes embarrassing failure. Needless to say, the sequel, <laughs> The History of the World Part 2, was never made. <laughs> but while Mel Brooks' movie was criticized for being incoherent and unfunny, there are times, let's be honest, when this is exactly what world history can feel like to us, from our perspective. Shakespeare famously wrote, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. But if this world is a stage and we're all actors in a play, then it often appears to us, doesn't it, as though there isn't a script or a plot 
or a director who's calling the shots. That's what it can feel like at times. When we look at the news, when we look in our own lives. And that is why Revelation is such an important book. Revelation was written to encourage uh, confused Christians who were struggling to live for Jesus in a hostile world and wondering whether anyone was really in control. Uh, about 60 years had passed since Jesus had risen and ascended. And in that time, many people had become Christians. The church had spread across the Roman Empire. And yet persecution had also grown. And the generation who'd seen Jesus in the flesh, as it were, well, they were dying out. John was probably the last surviving apostle from Jesus' inner circle. But he'd been banished to a remote island. What was going on? What was God doing? Was he really in control? Uh, And look, as we look out at our world today... These are questions we can sometimes be tempted to ask as well, aren't they? As the persecution of believers in many countries continues and intensifies every year, it seems, to new, higher levels. As we watch war and conflict unfold in grisly detail on our TV screens, we can be tempted to wonder, has the plot been lost? Where is history heading Is God really in control? And that's the question Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5 answer. They provide the reassurance that despite appearances, the plot has not been lost. Revelation 4 and 5, they set the scene for everything else that follows in Revelation See, one of the keys to uh, reading Revelation correctly and understanding it is remembering that it's not chronologically structured, it's cyclically structured. Revelation contains a cycle of visions, a number of visions, one after the other, that do the same thing, that replay world history from different perspectives. Whatever happens in history, God has not lost the plot. He is on the throne. And that's what we saw last week from chapter 4 particularly. Jonathan so helpfully took us through that first part of the first vision that John sees of the throne room of God in heaven. It's kind of the setting for Revelation chapter 5 we're looking at tonight. As we saw last week, the, the, that vision of the throne room of God is full of colorful symbols and images Typical of apocalyptic literature, the genre in which Revelation is written. But the central image in both Revelation 4 and 5 is the throne of God. We saw that last week. The word throne is used 19 times in Revelation 4 and 5. The throne, that is the focal point of everything and everyone in these two chapters. But at the end of chapter 4, as it were, after we've caught our breath, having seen this magnificent vision of the throne room of God, we are left with an obvious question. How does all that connect to us? And that's what chapter 5, part 2 of John's first vision, shows us. In chapter 5, John realizes, he sees that the plot has not been lost The one on the throne has a plan to restore this world. And if we put our trust in him, we can be part of the storyline. And that makes chapter 5 one of the most thrilling chapters in the Bible, if you're a believer. Revelation 5 shows us that history is going somewhere. It's heading somewhere. And there are three things in chapter 5 that reinforce that truth. The first reason we can be sure that the plot has not been lost is because there's a script. God has a plan. Uh, In chapter 5, a new object, a new symbol is introduced, the scroll. Look at verse 1 of chapter 5. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who 
is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Now, we don't need to guess what the scroll symbolizes. We're told very clearly at the beginning of chapter 4. So in chapter 4 and verse 1, the risen Jesus tells John, I will show you what must take place after this. Uh, We have to wait, though, until chapter 5 to get that. Chapter 4, the scene is set, and then the scroll is introduced. The scroll that contains the things that must take place place after this. It contains, if you like, God's plan to restore this fallen world. This is God's plot line for world history in the scroll. Uh, In ancient times, scrolls were made by gluing sheets of papyrus um, together into one long sheet that was then rolled up tightly and sealed by the sender. Uh, We'll see next week from chapters 6 and 7 what happens when the scroll is unsealed and unrolled and history is revealed. But for now, John highlights three things about this scroll and by extension world history. Firstly, do you notice it's in the hand of God? Isn't that encouraging? The scroll is in the hand of the one who is on the throne. This world isn't out of control, despite appearances. It is in his control. The future isn't in our hands, as we sometimes think. It is in his hands. What a relief. Secondly, it's written on both sides. In Bible times, you only tended to write on one side of a scroll. There was one side that was easier to write on. The other side was harder because of kind of the grain of the the reed that had been used in the papyrus. But the scroll in John's vision has writing on both sides. It's symbolic. It indicates that this is a comprehensive, full, exhaustive account. It's not just a summary. It's the full script It's comprehensive, it's exhaustive, it's complete. God isn't just in charge, he has detailed plans and purposes. He is sovereign over every detail. Thirdly, it's sealed up. In verse 3, John realizes there's a problem. The scroll is sealed with seven seals. Now, as I said, we'll read more about those seven seals next week. When we look at the second vision of, that John has of the seals. But in chapter 5, the key thing that's being emphasized is that because it's sealed up, no one is able to open the scroll. No one is able to set in motion God's redemption plan to restore this fallen world. No one in heaven or on earth is worthy enough to do it. This isn't a question of strength. I haven't got the strength to break the seals. That's not the issue. The question is one of authority. No one in heaven or on earth has the right to enact God's plan to restore the world. No one in heaven or on earth has the authority to deal with sin once and for all and redeem fallen humanity. And that causes John to weep and weep. And who can blame him? Because if no one can open the scroll, the story can't move forward. There's no possibility of a happy ending at all. There's no hope for us as sinners who are separated from God. There's no hope for this fallen, broken, hostile world. John weeps, and who can blame him? Because the scroll is like a lock without a key. So the big question is, who's got the key? Who can open the scroll? Is anyone worthy enough to do that? Is anyone worthy enough to enact God's plan of salvation and restore this world? Bring history to its final completion. And wonderfully, you know the answer, in verse 5, we learn there is someone who is worthy to open the scroll. The second reason we know the plot has not been lost 
is because there's a hero. There's a hero to the story. God has sent a saviour. Just when it seems the show can't go on, John gets good news. There is someone worthy to open the scroll. Look at verse 5. Then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. There's no doubt about the identity of this heroic figure. Just as the one on the throne is never named as God, so this lion-like lamb is never directly named as Jesus, but his identity is meant to be obvious to us. In verse 5, he's described as the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David. Two titles that allude to the saviour king God had promised he would send from the line of Judah, from the line of David, the king who would come to restore the fortunes of his people. They are heroic, kingly titles Titles that convey strength and power and authority. And that's why verse 6 is such a surprise, isn't it? Because when John looks around for the, the, the lion king who is worthy to enact God's plans for the world, what he sees is a bloodstained lamb. He's looking for a lion. He sees a lamb. Do you notice this lamb has clearly been dead? He looks as if he's been slain, but he is now very much alive again. He is standing in the center of the throne, in the place reserved for God alone. It's an indication of his equality with God. This lamb is a lamb that's been slain, but is now alive again and is equal with God. Kind of, it's not difficult to work out who this is, is it? And we, we see the extent of his divine authority is underlined by the number of horns he has and the number of eyes he has. This is a lamb like no other lamb that you've ever seen before. It's why it's, we know it's symbolic. He has seven horns, he has seven eyes. Uh, in the Bible, a horn is a symbol of power and strength. Eyes are often a symbol of knowledge. But this lamb has seven of each. It's a number associated again and again in Revelation with completeness. You get lots of sevens in Revelation. And it's a number associated with completeness. Probably because the seventh day of creation was when God rested because his work was complete. But all the symbolism points in one direction, doesn't it? This lamb is equal with God. This lamb has God's authority. And this is why he is able to take the scroll from the hand of God. You and I could never have done anything like that. He has the authority to take the scroll from God's hand. He is the, Jesus is the lion-like lamb in John's vision, he alone is worthy to take forward God's plan to redeem and restore the world. But you notice there's another reason why the lamb in John's vision is worthy to open the scroll. In verse 8, those around the throne fall down in worship before the lamb and they sing a song that reveals why he's worthy. Verse 9. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. In his gospel, John records the words of one man, 
John the Baptist, when he sees Jesus for the first time. John chapter 1, verse 29, John the Baptist declares, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But in this vision, John sees the same truth declared by all the hosts of heaven. Not one man, the whole of heaven. Jesus' work on the cross is the focal point of history. It is the theme of heaven's praises. Because it guarantees that there will be a happy ending to the story. You see, through his death, Jesus paid the ransom price for our sin. He absorbed the judgment that we deserve. He purchased the souls of all those who turn to him and put their trust in him. And that is why he is the only one who is worthy to open the scroll. When we turn on the TV news, we see the mess the world is in. We can so easily feel the plot has been lost. But John reminds us here that it's not. Right now, the risen Jesus is standing at the center of the throne in heaven in the place of unassailable authority. He is the hero of heaven. He will be the hero of eternity. He is enacting God's plan of salvation. The scroll has been opened. History is heading somewhere. One day, everything will culminate when he returns. And a new heavens and a new earth are brought in, a new creation. And look, one of the reasons that we can be confident of that is because, thirdly and lastly, do you notice? There's a cast. God is inviting all sorts of people. In verse 9, those around the throne praise Jesus, the Lamb who has been slain, because he has redeemed people from every tribe and language and people and nation. God is gathering a countless cast of people from every corner of the world to be part of his heavenly drama. And in verse 10, they praise Jesus because of the way he has transformed their status. Let's look again from verse 9. They sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. You see, when we put our trust in Jesus, our status is radically changed. We're no longer sinners under God's judgment. We're made kings and priests in his service. We're given royal status and free access to him. And one day in the new creation, we will reign with Jesus we will finally fulfill the creation mandate given to Adam and Eve, but ruined by the fall, that we will rule the world and subdue it. That's what they were told to do. They got it wrong. One day that will be fulfilled as we reign with Jesus. You see, if you're a follower of Jesus, the future is bright. However it looks at the moment, despite appearances, the world is going somewhere. The plot has not been lost. God's plans will come to pass. Jesus will one day return. And in response to this great news, heaven and earth and all of the universe in this vision erupts into praise. Verses 11 to 14, the praise of heaven, which starts around the throne, expands to fill the whole universe by the end of the chapter. It is a glimpse of the joy that will erupt and endure for all eternity when Jesus finally returns and restores creation and history has a full stop at the end. Look at verse 11. Let's use some imagination here. We imagine, imagine this, what's being described here. Then I looked and heard the voice 
of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them. That's about everything, isn't it? Saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said amen and the elders fell down and worshipped. What a climax to this drama. And if you are a follower of Jesus, you will be there. Your voice will join in that song of praise. Think of it. Imagine it. 10,000 times 10,000 angels. That's 100 million angels. What a backing track. What a backing choir. What a sound they'll make. You'll be there. And what will the theme of our song be? Worthy is the Lamb. The focal point of heaven for all eternity will be Jesus. And if he is going to be the focal point of our worship then, surely he must be the focal point of our lives now. Why would we try to plot our own path through life? Try to go it alone and kind of make up our own story when there is a greater story that's already been written, that's being enacted right now around the world in the midst of this fallen world that will be the climax of history. Why would we try and plot our own path when there's such a greater story that's already been written? It's the storyline that Jesus went to the cross to make possible and that you and I are invited to be part of. So why delay? And why get distracted with anything else? Join the cast. Play your part. Entrust your future to Jesus. In his commentary on Revelation, Steve Wilmshurst writes this. At times in our lives when we face relationships that break down, betrayal, our fears for our future, our disappointments in other people, our shame in ourselves, it seems that there is no script at all. Yet the plot is not lost. It is in the hands of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. There is a plan and a purpose in the world, a great unfolding story. So look to the Lamb on the throne. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you that you are worthy of all honor and glory and praise. You are worthy. You are worthy because you are the king of kings, the one who stands at the center of the throne of heaven, the one who has all authority in heaven and on earth. But you're also worthy because you're the lamb who was slain, the one who gave up your life so that we might be released from our debt of sin and made kings and priests, royal status, free access. We praise you that you are worthy and are building your kingdom on earth, made up of people from every tribe and language and nation. Help us to live for you now and live in the light of your return when you will make all things right. For we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, before we take communion together and give thanks for the Lamb of God who was slain for us, we are going to listen to a song based on Revelation chapter 5. You may already know Andrew Peterson's song, He is Worthy, which is based on this, this chapter. If you do, the lyrics are in the video, so please do sing along. Um, if you don't know it, you might just want to stick with the ones in brackets, which are the responses um, to uh, the song. And then after we've, we've watched this and uh, maybe 
uh, worshipped in our hearts or all our lips, Duncan will come and lead us in the time of communion. Does our God intend? 